Welcome and thank you for joining our 2021 Outlook from the Wealth Management Team. I'm Anthony Valeri, Director of Investment Management. With me is Robert Spendlove, Economic and Public Policy Officer. And we will take about 20 minutes or so to give our thoughts on the economy and financial markets as we look ahead to 2021. Let's get started with our Outlook on the economy. Robert, let me give you, let me turn it over to you. Thanks, Anthony, it's great to be with you. Uh, you know, what, what we've seen in 2020 is truly historic. Uh, the, the kind of changes that we've seen, uh, really, we've never seen before. You have to go back 100 years to the, to the uh, last pandemic to see these kind of impacts. Uh, and, and you can really see that with the uh, monthly jobs report. So this is the report released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And it shows uh, that early on uh, in the in the kind of recovery period of the economy, we saw big increases in, uh, in job growth, uh, 2.5 million in May, uh, over 4.5 million in June. But then you see how that started to drop down and that growth ha has been slowing every month uh, since July. And then finally in December, uh, the economy uh, started to reverse this momentum. And we, we actually lost 140,000 jobs in the US economy in, in December. When we look at uh, kind of the, the, the different parts of the, uh, of the economy, the unemployment rate, again, shows the very historic nature of what we've seen. Looking back in, in 2009, so uh, coming out of the Great Recession, the unemployment rate topped out at 10%. Uh, and if you think about how tough that period was, uh, and then it slowly came down since then, uh, and again, until this year, when the unemployment rate jumped to 14.7%. Now, it's uh, uh, something, again, we haven't seen before. You really have to go back to the Great Depression to see unemployment rate uh, at, uh, above 14%. Now, it's come down since then. And we're down to about 6.7%, uh, but we're not uh, quite to that level where we'd want to be. That natural level of unemployment is generally around 4 to 5%. So we're still a little bit higher than that. Uh, uh, I'd like to see that number coming down a little bit more before I feel more confident uh, in the labor market, but it is good to see that uh, dropping down further. When we look at uh, some of the other indicators of the economy, our, our broadest measure of the economy is gross domestic product. This is really the, the value of all goods and services in the economy. And uh, for this data set, I'm going back as far as it's possible that th this is the entire series of gross domestic product. Uh, you know, I wish, I wish we could go back even further because uh, what we saw in 2020 uh, dwarfs anything we've ever seen before. To put it in perspective, in 1957, uh, GDP dropped by 10%. That was uh, the, the, the largest drop we've ever seen before this year. But in the second quarter, it dropped 31%. Uh, so again, just uh, uh, more than, uh, than we've ever seen before. But then coming out of it, third quarter of 2020 saw an increase of 33.4%. Uh, to put that in perspective, in 1977, GDP increased by 16.4%. So we had a historic drop in the second quarter, a historic increase uh, in the third quarter. Uh, so just these dramatic swings up and down. Uh, but you have to put this in perspective too. When you look at these numbers, you may say, well, down 31%, but then up 33%, we're out of the hole. But if you look at the absolute value of GDP uh, in the next slide, what you see is that uh, the, the actual value of GDP shows that we have not surpassed the pre-crisis pre levels yet. Uh, we reached an all-time high in GDP in the fourth quarter of 2019, saw that, uh, that low point in the second quarter. But even with the big growth of the, uh, of the third quarter, we still remain uh, be below those levels that we had seen uh, uh, before, the, before the pandemic hit. So kind of putting it all together, looking at uh, what, what we see happening in the economy and going forward. Uh, one of the, the big issues that is being debated right now is what's going to happen with inflation. And uh, the, this is probably the, the, the number one uh, debate going on 
in markets and in, in economics right now. And on one side, so this is kind of the, the view from the Fed. Uh, Jerome Powell has, uh, has said, you know, they are not concerned about inflation at all. And if you look at this data, this is the consumer price index. The Fed's preferred level is right there at uh, the yellow line at 2%. And uh, we have seen uh, CPI be much higher than that. If you go back in 2008, we had uh, inflation above 5%. And our long-term trend has been right around that Fed's preferred level. But recently, we actually uh, saw uh, disinflationary pressure. Uh, we almost had deflation earlier this year. The two other times when we've seen actual deflation was during the Great Recession when uh, housing prices tumbled. And then again, in uh, 2015, when energy markets uh, saw a dramatic decrease. And so the Fed's point is, uh, not only are we not at the Fed's preferred level, but we're below that level. Now, on the other side, when you look at some of the inflationary pressures that are going on right now, once again, you know, uh, housing is driving, uh, is driving inflation as well. We're seeing big increases in home prices. Equity markets are very strong right now, which is also uh, uh, contains that inflationary pressure. Uh, and those low interest rates are spurring uh, more, uh, more buying in the economy. And so there's kind of this back and forth going on right now about whether uh, as the economy reopens, as, as the pandemic uh, lets off, will we see that pent up demand uh, return and will we see a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of consumer demand turn into much higher inflation? Looking at uh, uh, kind of our, uh, what we expect to see over the next, uh, the, the next few months and into the, the next year. Uh, again, what we saw was dramatic. It was uh, more than we've ever seen before. It was, it's uh, uh, been a, had a severe impact on the economy. We're entering a period right now uh, where because even though we have started distribution of the vaccine, we're seeing surges in different parts of the country, there's still a lot of pain. Uh, there's still a lot of struggles. And uh, right now the uh, economy is going through a rough stretch. And that rough stretch will continue uh, for the next several months. Uh, and, and those sectors that have really been hit, uh, like leisure and hospitality, like bars and restaurants, uh, personal services, travel services, will continue uh, to suffer over the next three to six months. Uh, and because of that, it is uh, imperative that we continue to get that support from state and federal governments. Keep in mind that the, 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 the recession that we experienced in 2020 was not because of any underlying weakness in the economy. It wasn't because of any uh, uh, policy flaws or uh, any inefficiencies. It was because of the pandemic and the economy was fundamentally strong before that. But because of the nature of this, it is essential that, uh, that the federal government and state governments provide that support to those industries that have been uh, uh, impacted. Now, as the vaccine rollout continues, we will see uh, people kind of returning back to uh, previous activities. We'll see that, uh, that demand, that pent up demand uh, cause more consumer spending and more consumer demand. Uh, and that will cause the, the, the economy in the second half of the year will uh, grow dramatically. But uh, uh, one of the things is, and we don't know exactly what it's gonna look like, but the economy a year from now will look different than it did a year ago. Right now we're going through some fundamental changes in our economy and kind of the, the nature of our economy. And it will, uh, uh, it will uh, definitely be different than what we've seen in the past. And that's kind of the nature of a dynamic economy uh, moving forward. Thanks so much, Anthony. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate your thoughts on, on the economy as, uh, as we look forward to continued recovery. So we'll transition to what is next for financial markets, our expectation for the U.S. equity markets, mid single digit returns based on strong earnings growth and actually lower valuations as we expect a pretty strong growth in corporate earnings. 23% is the consensus, so a, a, a big bounce back, not unusual 
uh, in on the aftermath of a recession. Uh, so yes, stock valuations are expensive, but supported by a number of factors, not just earnings, but continued economic improvement, likely to get additional fiscal stimulus from the US government. And then as Robert mentioned, vaccine distribution, key support that'll be developing and ongoing over the coming months. We also think it's important that investors heed the lessons of 2020. I'll cover that towards the end of this uh, market section. For the bond market, expect low single digit returns. There's just not much return you can get out of the very low and historically low yields that we are seeing in the bond market. However, bonds as an asset class continue to play a key diversification role. Uh, they continue to be a buffer against equity market declines. We do blend in within our bond allocation some more economically sensitive fixed income sectors like high yield, like emerging market debt to not only boost yield, but provide a little bit of a buffer against rising interest rates. So let's get more into detail on our outlook for the financial markets. Uh, one of the areas that cannot be ignored is just the robust response from the government. This doesn't even take into account how aggressive the Fed and other central banks around the world have been. But when you look at US fiscal policy, and this is through the end of 2020, it's nearly double the response of the 2008, 2009, or 2008 financial crisis. You can see it here on this chart, almost 16% of GDP through the end of 2000, or from what we've seen implemented so far uh, versus 2008 and nine. So really incredible response. More fiscal stimulus is coming as President Biden has already proposed. Those negotiations will be ongoing. There is also a potential infrastructure bill coming later uh, this year. So the, all of those uh, bode well for providing the foundation for financial markets to benefit but we'll continue to watch. So markets have priced in a lot of that good news. The stock market rally from the low on March 23, and that's the la uh, last row on this table here, uh, the strongest on record after a, a recession. So uh, one of the, a very robust response and I thought it was instructive to look at, you know, after the market has rallied so strongly from the low, and this is comparing some of the strongest rallies, nine months rallies after uh, a bear market, what happens next? Uh, and over the next nine months, the average return is positive in all but two cases with an average return of 8.1%. So the market usually continues to add on to those gains and I'll follow up with another slide on that. However, on the far right, you can also see that there is a decline over that period. So while the markets ultimately move higher over the course of that period, you do see a correction or a pullback and that is just normal behavior in the market. So while we do expect continued gains in the equity market, do keep in mind that volatility is likely to return at some point. So the op uh, optimistic uh, on the future, and if you look uh, in the past, anytime you've seen a bull market post a recession, which has usually been accompanied by a start sharp sell-off, and in this case, I didn't include, uh, I included 1987, which was not a recession, but looking at stock market declines of 25% or more, you can see that the blue represents the first year return, which in most cases was very strong. So the 12 months after a 25% decline have been very strong. In the second year, you can see that in all of these cases, the stock market continued to add to gains. And that's because as the economy continues to gain momentum, it's usually not a one trick pony. These, this improvement begins to build on itself and the market responds with additional gains during the second year. So through the end of uh, December, a pretty strong return as you'd seen on par with what we saw in 2000 and nine, but again, based on history, bodes well for additional gains in the second year. Let's move a little bit to talk about relative valuations. This is a hot topic in the market. Stocks are expensive when you look at traditional metrics like the price to earnings ratio, which on forward earnings is 23, is a PE ratio of 23, well above historical average of 16. But you have to take it into account relative to bonds. So while the high valuations in stocks are certainly a concern. When you look at it relative to bonds, uh, it's much more normal. And this is basically the Fed model, which is called, uh, which we use to evaluate what we call the equity risk premium. How do we evaluate whether stocks are attractive or expensive relative to bonds? Uh, the higher this line is, the more attractive equities are, and vice versa. The lower or more negative 
that premium, then bonds are more attractive relative to stocks. And you can see the historical average. There was a spike in April of 2020 after the sell-off from the coronavirus and the pandemic. You can see as the stock market has rebounded, this premium has come back down uh, to the two and a half percent range, which is roughly in line with the historic average. So in line with the average, but certainly not overvalued when you compare to bonds. And here we look at the earnings yield, which is simply the earnings divided by the price index, and then compare it to the 10-year treasury yield, which is currently right around 1%. So relative to bonds, uh, stocks in our view are relatively valued and why it uh, behooves investors to remain uh, in the stock market and stay invested. Within the stock market, we continue to see a growth signal, which is a relatively healthy development. So when we look at more discretionary items versus conservative consumer staples, you'll see that the two uh, sectors of the S&P 500, the consumer discretionary uh, equal weight versus the consumer staples equal weight, uh, you'll see a rising line which indicates consumer discretionary is outperforming. Obviously, the reverse was too true heading into the, the pandemic. This is largely intact. So we're li likely to see some fluctuation and volatility along the way. But this is a growth signal from the market. It indicates a healthy market. Participation in the market in terms of the number of stocks rising is still relatively healthy. This doesn't preclude a correction or drawdown in the stock market, but it does suggest that this market remains healthy and we do not expect a bear market to resume. When we look at what are potential catalysts down the line, well, there's still a lot of cash on the sidelines, although some of that has come back into the market. Money market fund assets are still very, very, very elevated, even at the end of 2020. So there is some dry powder, additional momentum for the stock market. Yes, there are certain areas of the market that are, in my view, speculative and certainly concerning. Bitcoin is an example, maybe some of the tech names. But when you look at the broader equity markets, domestic and international, we still think that is the best way for investors to grow their capital. So potential more money on the sideline to boost uh, financial markets here. And since we've just come out of an election, I thought it worthwhile to revisit what uh, politics mean. And the uh, an short answer is not much. Our mantra is profits over politics. Stocks are not partisan. When you look at the composition of the government, and this is going back to 1933, and in the lower left, you'll see there whether it's a Republican Senate, Democratic House, Republican uh, president and the various combinations you see listed there that returns have been broadly strong. In gold is the current combination, Democratic Congress and Democratic President. Uh, we also, you can see the lowest returns under a Democratic Congress and Republican President. Haven't had too many examples of that, but that is the lowest return. But by and large, returns strong across the board. And that basically tells you stocks don't care about the political environment much. It, it does impact policy at the margin and profits from some industries. For the broad market, it certainly takes a backseat to the, the fundamental growth of the economy, what the Federal Reserve is doing in the level of interest rates, as well as inflation and corporate profits. So politics, not a major driver, uh, and just important to know that and reiterate this point. Let's move uh, to the bond markets here where the uh, high average, average high yield bond spread is hovering just around 4%, actually just below that in recent days. This has been relatively stable and looked at two ways. One, although it is close to a historic lows, it is, not, it is still above pre-pandemic levels. It's also relatively stable. And if there was a problem with the economy or greater risk to the macro outlook, you'd see it reflected in the high yield bond market. You're not seeing that there is stability and calm here, which bodes well for further equity market gains down the road. We also use a small allocation to high yield bonds with a four percentage point yield advantage to add a little bit of yield and provide a buffer against rising interest rates. So still a, an allocation here makes sense. As we look at bonds broadly, and we're talking about the high quality market, one way to predict what will bonds do in the future is to look at the yield on the 10 year treasury, which is the blue line. And if we shift that forward 10 years, you can see how it does a good job of predicting the annualized 10 year return from the bond market as measured by the Bloomberg Barclays Aggregate Bond Index. The yield now would tell you it's about a 1% total return going forward when you throw in uh, corporate bonds and some of the other sectors is probably one to two, but that is still a very low return environment for high quality bonds. Uh, so you can see that 
relationship we think it'll hold, but why do you own bonds in such a low yielding environment? Well, it's because bonds still play a key diversification role. This table explains that. If we go back to 2010, and this is an era of low interest rates where the Federal Reserve had cut interest rates very, very low, had initiated bond purchasing known as QE, quantitative easing. Uh, there are uh, eight examples here where the stock market was down 10%, approximately 10% or more, uh, how long that lasted and what the stock market return as measured by the S&P 500 was, and then also what the bond market return was. And you can see that during that correction in the stock market, which on average at the bottom there was down just over 16%, the bond market on average was up 1.4%. Now on an absolute basis, that is a low number, it doesn't sound exciting, but that is a significant difference versus stocks. Uh, in fact, almost 18 percentage point difference. So it does highlight that even in a low interest rate environment, the bond market can play important diversification benefits. So important to know that bonds still work in this environment at the margin. We can change the allocations, but it is still important to buffer against those equity market declines with high quality bonds. And then let's, let's transition to some of the lessons for 2000, from 2020. One was to stay invested and it's worth revisiting to look at charts about you know, what is the, the penalty of trying to time the market, get out of the market and even missing some of the fewest best days uh, can really impact returns. You can see being fully invested from 1995 through the end, through the end of November, 2020, 8.3% total return. And you can see that less the five best, less 10 best of those returns start to slowly decline. In fact, if you miss the 40 best days, your return becomes negative. So really a drag if you miss those uh, up days, it's important to stay invested. As dark and as gloomy as it looked in March, investors who stayed the course were rewarded. And it's also important to know what you are investing for. If your horizon is three years or longer, stay the course because ultimately you will be rewarded. Uh, as a famous investor once said, time in the market is more important than timing the market. So again, stay invested and you will be rewarded over the longer term. Uh, and also a reminder that volatility is normal. I, I like to bring up this chart from time to time showing that 75% of the time the stock market finishes a calendar year higher. However, as these red dots show, the there is an intra-year decline and the red dots represent the maximum intra-year decline for any given year in the S&P 500. Uh, and 2020 was another example, the maximum decline almost 34%, but ultimately the S&P 500 finishing 16% higher. So uh, remember that volatility is normal. In the coming year, we have shifted slightly more to emerging market equities and international because of slightly better valuations relative to US stocks. But again, uh, it's important to stay diversified. And here's an example of that. Impossible to time those switches in the market. This is large cap US stocks. This is where you'll see a lot of your big uh, technology names. You can see the outperformance of large cap from early 2018. And actually have been longer than that. But for this example, just showing from late 2018 all the way to early 2020, almost a 40 percentage point gap to small company stocks, but it stabilized in 2020. And then starting in October, a dramatic reversal where small caps began to outperform large caps. These types of moves are impossible to time. It, it Again, it, it is super important to stay diversified and maybe make some changes at the margin, but to maintain a diversified approach so because you never know what segment of the market might be benefiting more at any particular given time. So important lessons uh, on behalf of uh, Robert and everyone in the wealth management team. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed our 2021 outlook. We'll be speaking to you again soon. Thank you.